With this video, we start the second of third, uh, second of the third units um, on reproduction, um, and this is specifically looking at gametogenesis. And so, the first unit we looked at um, all of the reproductive hormones and how the hormones are involved in our reproductive system. Um, in this unit, we'll be looking at how the gametes are actually formed. Um, and so a lot of the terminology that's going to be used here is going to go back to um, when we looked at meiosis. And so we, in terms, it, it's really important to understand and it's really important to have that basis um, of understanding uh, the concept of meiosis when you're looking at uh, gametogenesis. And so unit 50 as, as a whole, uh, keeping in mind that um, this uh, reproduction is covering both standard and higher level, gametogenesis is specifically uh, topic 11. And so this is a higher level topic. Um, and it's, it is a bit of a short topic. And so we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, there should only be two videos on this, one on uh, spermatogenesis. Uh, which will be this video, the first one, and the second video will be looking at oogenesis um, with a comparison of the two um, at the end of the second video. And so we get in right into um, looking at um, into spermatogenesis. And so it, it really, in terms of the process itself, it's really important that you understand, um, it, it, that you understand the structure of where sperm is produced. And so we know for a fact, and we talked about this in the last unit, that sperm is produced in the testes. And so the testes, um, just as a terminology, testes, uh, uh, the testes actually, uh, is uh, singular. Uh, just a matter of pronouncing it, uh, the testes, uh, if I can spell it, the testes are plural. And so it's a matter of just being able to orient yourself and being able to understand what's going on inside your test, uh, inside the test, uh, inside, inside a single testes, but also understanding this is happening in both of the testes. And so it will look at one, but there is, a, but it's happening in both. And so we'll we'll start at uh, as we have for all of these structures where um, where we're looking at something where 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 a product is being produced. We'll look at where it's being produced, and then we'll go on to where it's going to go. Now, the one thing, just in terms of an orientation, um, this tube right here, um, this tube is the vas deferens. Uh, this is the tube that connects your testes um, to the penis. And so that's your orientation. And so that's the vas deferens right here. Um, and this is the tube that uh, sperm travels uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the tube that sperm travels through uh, at ejaculation. So initially it's going to go through here, but eventually it's the vas deferens that's going to connect the testes um, to the penis. And so that's the one connection that I'm going to talk about initially. Um, however, now we go into the, into the actual source. And so when we're looking at the testy itself, um, the main structure that we look at um, is uh, what we call the seminiferous, the seminiferous tubules. And so the seminiferous tubules, and I'll just highlight it here, um, the seminiferous tubules are right here. And so the, the seminiferous tubules um, are the inner portions uh, just inside this bit right there. Um, and the seminiferous tubules um, are the location uh, of spermatogenesis. And so in the next diagram, we will look at um, uh, what happens inside the seminiferous tubules uh, specifically. Now, once sperm is produced inside the seminiferous tubules, um, sperm will travel towards the middle of the testes um, into, uh, towards um, something called the rate of testi, uh, the rate of testes, and towards what we have uh, is called, um, we generally just call it the collecting duct. 
Um, and so the idea is that all of these seminiferous tubules right here are all collecting um, the sperm that are being produced uh, towards the collecting duct. And so the collecting duct is where you have a merging of multiple seminiferous tubules. And this is very similar to when we talked about, uh, if I can spell this, uh, this is very similar to when we talked about the kidney, when we had multiple nephrons that were all collecting, the, all the collecting ducts were all coming and collecting it into one space. And so you have multiple seminiferous tubules. Um, the sperm that's released here is actually immature sperm at this point. And so the sperm, if this sperm were to be released into a vagina, um, this sperm would not be able to uh, fertilize an egg. And so it, the, it's the merging of multiple seminiferous tubules um, that carry with immature sperm. Now all of this is going to carry it away, um, and so the collecting duct is also, the actual name of it is called the vasa efferentia. Um, you can use either name if you want. The collecting duct is usually sort of a general name that we use. Um, the sperm is then carried away um, via the collecting duct away towards, um, so this is all of the collecting duct right here, so that would be collecting duct and the vasa efferentia. Um, and so it's going to get carried away by something called the epididymis. And so this portion right here is what we call the epididymis. And so the epididymis um, is, um, it's where you have, um, it's in between the collecting duct and, and the point at which um, sperm makes its way to the epididymis um, is where um, at this point sperm has matured now. And so the sperm at the epididymis, if you were to take a sample of sperm from the epididymis as compared to the collecting duct, um, you would now have mature sperm. And so the sperm here inside the epididymis, it's a collective, it's a storage um, facility really. And so the sperm that, will, that are in the epididymis will mature and they will wait um, for ejaculation. If there is no ejaculation, um, they will die and they will get replaced um, by more sperm being produced. And then, and then the epididymis eventually, it sort of curls around and then eventually connects to the uh, vas deferens, uh, which is only used in, uh, during ejaculation. Um, or there is often a sort, a sort of a, a regular release of uh, sperm fl or, or sperm in, in the fluid. Um, and so there can be some release of fluid in, in sort of not even like if you're not looking at ejaculate itself. Um, and and so the, in terms of, in terms of uh, sperm that's found in the epididymis, more often than not, you're wait, the sperm are waiting uh, for ejaculation, but they will most often die. Uh, but there's always a constant um, creation of sperm uh, occurring uh, in the semin seminiferous tubules. So that's sort of the overview of what the entire uh, testicle looks like. Um, now, if we look specifically um, at this portion right here, just at the seminiferous tubule, and we take a cross-section of it, we'll look at some of the specific structures inside the seminiferous tubule. And so inside the seminiferous tubule is where you have the production of um, sperm. And so just to, just to point that out, so this is the production of sperm. And so in this diagram, we're going to look at, we're just taking a cross section of the seminiferous tubule, looking at um, specifically um, one section of it, but we will talk about um, specifically what happens to each cell um, over time um, during, as we, as we combine meiosis into this. 
in terms of in terms of the structures that are found inside the seminiferous tubules the first thing is and this is something that you have to keep in mind something about sperm um, is that sperm are, themselves are a very um, mobile structure they require a lot of energy and so these cells right here um, called the sertoli cells uh, these sertoli cells are there to provide uh, nutrients to the developing sperm and so as the sperm are developing those sperm need the nutrients to be able to sort of swim around they need to be able to grow they need to be able to mature and so the sertoli cells are providing all of those nutrients usually in the form of some sort of glucose um, and and they're going to provide those nutrients to the sperm in terms of the different layers of cells that are found, um, and it is a layer of cells that are found uh, uh, in terms of the different um, levels of maturity of the cells, um, there's four levels of maturity and, and we look at them right here. And so keep in mind that at the end of the day, we're trying to, and, and this is going back to meiosis, we're trying to combine um, during fertilization, we're combining two haploid cells to, co to create one diploid 46 chromosome um, cell. And so initially, so during meiosis, during this time right here, we actually have meiosis going on. And so what's going to happen is the first, uh, the first actual, uh, the first layer of cells is actually the layer that's closest to the edge of the membrane. And, and, and the inside of this, remember, the inside of this tube is again the lumen. The closer we get to the middle of the lumen, um, that's where we have the more, uh, the actual sperm itself with the actual distinct tail of the sperm is actually being produced. And so the first type of cell that's actually produced is this first layer right here, this first cell called the spermatogonium. And at this point, the spermatogonium is still in a diploid form. And so the diploid form cell um, remember, you cannot have a diploid sperm fertilize another diploid egg because you would have a tetraploid, um, and that's something that you cannot have because you'd have too many chromosomes. And so meiosis is going to happen between the primary and the secondary spermatocytes uh, to ensure that the number of chromosomes is halved so that when fertilization occurs, um, you have the right number of chromosomes for the offspring. The second, layer of uh, the second layer of cells here um, is uh, this layer right here called the primary spermatocytes. Again, it's still a diploid. The third layer um, is sort of, it's, it, it really is, it's, it's some, for some of these, it's really hard to distinguish. Um, but for the third layer, um, it is, I'm just trying to find, I see which one it is. I believe it's this layer right here, that one. So it should actually come this way. That would be the secondary spermatocyte. And at this point, this is the first layer of cells, um, which has actually gone through meiosis. So at this point, um, from the spermatogonium to the spermatocyte, we have actually gone from, uh, we've gone down uh, from meiosis, uh, that's, for, that's during meiosis one. And then we've actually gone from, spermat uh, from the primary to the secondary spermatocyte. Um, that's when meiosis two has occurred. And then the final thing is the, is the start of the formation of what, what starts to look like um, a sperm. And that's what we call the, spermat uh, sp the spermatids. And again, this is a haploid. It starts to, it's sort of the, 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 the it sort of starts to build uh, the head of the sperm. And eventually you're going to start producing um, these uh, sperm-like structures. Remember, all the way up to the epididymis, um, it is all immature sperm. It's not until it starts getting stored inside the epididymis that the sperm actually starts to mature. And so within the seminiferous tubules and within uh, the collecting duct, um, the sperm itself is actually quite immature. Two other cells that are found, uh, one of them is the Leydig cells. The Leydig cells are responsible for providing uh, testosterone, so they secrete um, testosterone in the system. Um, and the second um, layer of cells, and that's, and that's I'm just going to highlight this here, that's this 
uh, membrane right here. So that's the membrane that's sort of on the outside with all the layers of cells on the inside. Um, that's the boundary or that's the, that's the, uh, that's the membrane that we call uh, the basement membrane. And you will remember this from when we talked about um, when we talked about the respiratory system. The basement membrane is just a framework of proteins that provide structure for the seminiferous tubules. And so, for it to remain and have specific structure, um, these, uh, the proteins that are found inside the basement membrane are crucial uh, to allow for the cells that are inside to remain inside this structure. So this, the layering that's found inside is due to the fact that they can actually attach themselves to the basement membrane. So in terms of what the seminiferous tubule looks like, that's, that's essentially what it is here. Um, and so um, the next step is essentially combining spermatogenesis with meiosis and looking at um, what this looks like um, when you combine the two of them together. And so in terms of spermatogenesis itself, um, you initially, if we looked at this right here, the first cells that we start with are the spermatogonians. And so actually the first cell that we start with is the germline cells. Um, the spermatogonium um, is what we call, um, it's a general germ cell. And at this point, the spermatogonium is actually, it's capable of um, undergoing, uh, capable of both meiosis and mitosis. And so it has the ability of meiosis and my meiosis and mitosis. And so it has the ability of not only dividing to create um, um, in, uh, dividing to create um, uh, gametes, but also creating um, uh, 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 dividing to create, I'm losing the word here, uh, dividing to create uh, identical cells. And so uh, using mitosis. And so at this point, the spermatogonium uh, is quite a flexible cell um, and it actually has to do with the specific genes that will actually turn on um, and that will cause meiosis 1 to start. And so the mitotic division, right, so both mitosis and meiosis will be occurring. You will have mitosis occurring, right, so mitosis is going to happen and mitosis will keep happening. All right, so mitosis will keep happening. So therefore you have an unlimited supply of spermatogonium. So it just keeps producing spermatogonium, uh, spermatogonium. But also, um, it also is able to use some of the, the, the formed spermatogonium um, and it's able to um, start meiosis one. And so meiosis 1, and that's the reason why when we looked at, if you remember back to meiosis 1, after meiosis 1, um, you do have a splitting of the cells, but the cells are still diploid at that point. And so even um, at the end of meiosis 1, the primary spermatocytes are still diploid here. It's not until you have meiosis 2 occur um, where you actually have, um, you have the secondary spermatocytes occur, um, which is when you have the first haploid cells produced. And so when meiosis occurs here, you have the initial, um, you have the first, uh, you have the primary spermatocyte, which is again a diploid. Um, the primary spermatocyte, um, it is sort of, it's just a replicated version of the spermatogonium. Um, and so uh, you can sort of write this, and if you notice the wording here, it's the prophase of meiosis one. So it's literally, um, it's literally at the start um, of meiosis one that you convert from spermatogonium to primary spermatocytes. And so this is a very early stage um, of the cell, but it's still that single cell that you started with. And so this is just that you have the chromosomes uh, the chromosomes have uh, 
replicated. And so at this point, you have, um, you have uh, meiosis 1 occurring. Um, after this point, you have your first meiotic division. Um, and so uh, after the first meiotic division, you have the production of the secondary spermatocytes, um, where you have your first haploid cells produced. Um, you have meiosis 2 occur after this, where it produces the spermatids. The spermatids are going to be your four um, cells. And these are the four cells that are produced that are, these are the result of meiosis two. And in the case of um, spermatogenesis, um, it, is, um, it is the case of uh, spermatogenesis that uh, these are gonna be differentiated into sperm. And so in the case, specifically in the case here, so when we, when we go from primary to secondary spermatocytes, um, this first uh, meiotic division is actually triggered. Um, and this is something that's going to be a bit of a surprise, uh, but this is triggered by FSH. Now, you might be thinking that FSH is something that women um, or females have um, that triggers the stimulation of follicles, which you will be correct. But um, keep in mind, um, this technically is the stimulation of a follicle. And so even for men, um, this is actually triggered by the same hormone um, as females when uh, egg, uh, egg production occurs. And so the first meiotic division is actually triggered by FSH. However, the second meiotic division is where it gets a little bit different. Rather than estrogen taking over for women, the second meiotic division is initiated by testosterone. Uh, the equivalent here for women, and we'll talk about this in the next video, the equivalent here uh, would be estrogen taking over. And so this testosterone is released by the Leydig cells, and th these are going to then cause uh, the production of the four cells. These four cells are going to differentiate into what we look at and we, what we see as the, um, they differentiate into the sperm cells. And so the spermatids, um, and so essentially what you're doing or what's happening here is that the differentiation is just, um, it's the turning on or off of the genes, right? So if you remember back to way early on in, um, in IV1, uh, the differentiation is just the turning uh, on or off of genes at the right time and the right amount um, to specialize uh, in structure and function. And so just on the other side, you look at just a whole sort of picture here, and the production of the sperm inside the seminiferous tubules, they'll eventually develop and develop and they get released. Um, and so just in terms of what they look like, um, being made close to the basement membrane, you have the, spermato, uh, the, the spermatogonium along the basement membrane and the development goes this way. And so you have the sperm, the four sperm here, which then get released and they will then uh, uh, travel um, towards the epididymis. And so in terms of uh, what a mature um, sperm looks like, um, there are a couple parts to the mature sperm that you need to know. The main part of the sperm uh, that, uh, that, that, that really um, is, it's absolutely um, key, um, is the head. The head uh, has um, the front portion, which is called the acrosome. The acrosome is what carries um, the enzymes. So it contains the enzymes that will digest Uh, something called the zona pellucida, and we'll talk about this when we do oogenesis in the next video. The zona pellucida is sort of the outer lining um, of the egg, um, and that's the that's the that's the lining that has to be eaten away. Um, and that lining, once it's eaten away, or once it's sort of deactivated by one of the sperm, um, no other sperm can actually um, then. Uh, 
enter the egg. And so whichever sperm is able to uh, allow the enzymes to digest that zona pellucida, that sperm is then going to fertilize. The nucleus, um, the, the nucleus of, the, of the actual um, sperm itself uh, is this little thing right here. So that's the haploid uh, nucleus. This middle bit right here, um, that is the uh, midpiece. And inside the midpiece, you have, uh, I'm going to do some different color just to not mix it up. You've got many mitochondria. Um, and these my, many mitochondria, just keep in mind, remember, these sperm have to swim quite a long way. Dep keeping in mind the context that they're very small, they have a long distance to swim, um, so they have to produce a lot of ATP um, for to, that's going to fuel the tail movement. So the, the ATP will fuel the tail movement. And then finally, the last thing we have here is the tail itself. Um, and the tail is used for uh, propulsion. And so in terms of spermatogenesis, that's all. Um, so it, this is the detail in which you need to know about the sperm itself. Um, this is the detail in which you need to know about spermatogenesis. You need to be able to combine um, what you learned in meiosis and be able to describe the phases of meiosis to the phases of spermatogenesis and when both of those occur at the same time um, and be able to describe um, when the differentiation is actually occurring um, and then be able to actually talk about and describe um, the cross sections of both the testes and the seminiferous tubules. Um, in the next video, we will look at starting off with the cross-section of the ovary itself and looking at the egg. Uh, and then we'll look at the oogenesis, uh, looking at how the egg is actually produced. Similar structure in terms of the notes, what we looked at right now. Um, and then we will compare both oogenesis and spermatogenesis um, before uh, we finish this video. So the next video will be the last one uh, for unit 50.